Perfect. Yeah, that's better. Okay, so um, key topics in small or key health topics for uh, companion small ruminants. So um, over the last week or so, um, we've been uh, learning more about the Yukon small ruminant industry and also had the chance to talk to Bastian and Dr. Michelle about what the industry looks like in the Yukon, um, as well as um, you know, that you are, you know, working hard to try to get vet care and that you're often in remote areas and maybe aren't able to access vet care like you might in, you know, more densely populated uh, southwestern Ontario. So what I wanted to do is put together a presentation that's um, trying to empower or enable you to handle um, more medical stuff on farm. And one of the biggest challenges I find is that for small ruminant stuff in particular, there's a lot of information out there and some of it's really good and some of it's really bad. So the other goal of the presentation is to direct you towards the good stuff, the good information. Um, and I have made a PDF of this presentation and sent it to Bastian. So he can email you out the presentation and it has like all the links all the videos, all the extra reading, it's all there. So if there's something that I go over too fast or you want more information, the, the idea is, is that you can have that presentation as a good resource for later on. So we're going to talk about um, uh, first aid kit supplies and having a formulary on farm. Then we're going to go through um, some big common health issues. And then I have some resources for people as well. Um, so just to kind of quickly start here. Oh, oh there we go. Um, uh, I just put in a little slide about me. Um, I've worked with a lot of different animals, but I couldn't find a picture of me with a sheep or a goat. So I did a camel, which was kind of the closest thing I could find. Um, and so, yeah, so it, in my practice, we're doing a lot of um, like diversified hobby farms and smaller farms. So we do see a lot of sheep and goats. Um, we have herds all the way from, you know, very high level uh, breeding stock replacement herds with heritage breeds to, you know, large 500, 700 head uh, meat, meat sheep operations to, you know, fainting goat herds to, you know, petting zoos, all sorts of stuff. So we see all sorts of different types of sheep and goats and the presentation, it's, it's hard to kind of fit a one size fits all. Um, because there's so many different ways that we interact with sheep and goats in our, in our life. And, you know, when I was speaking to Dr. Michelle about the sheep and goats in the Yukon, um, it, it sounds very similar to my practice is that, you know, there's a lot of places that maybe have a, a couple sheep or goats, um, you know, those that are breeding animals or, or you know, have, have, uh, breeding stock or having babies, you know, kind of a, a small number. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of hobby farmers, pet goats, that sort of thing. So um, the, the industry is very diverse. And so it can be very hard to get good health recommendations that kind of, you know, fit a big, a, a large farm, a small farm, a meat farm, a dairy farm. So I've tried to put in things that can be applicable to all sorts of different people with, um, you know, additional resources where you can dive in a little bit deeper for your specific situation. So first things first is um, how are we going to handle small ruminant health issues on farm? I love my sheep. I love my goats. But I'm going to be real. They are the number one cause of out of hours emergencies for my clinic. Um, small rumens, they love to get sick. They love to get sick on a Saturday night. Um, they love to get sick after 9 p.m. They love to get sick in a snowstorm. So um, I can't tell you how important it is that you you have small ruminants, y'all, you just got to be prepared. That stuff is going to go down and you need to be ready for it. Um, they're, they're just, they just love to have health issues. So the first thing you need is a first aid kit. And so there's going to be two components of this first aid kit. The first is this slide that I have up here, which is the general first aid kit. And the second one is additional stuff you need if you're having babies. Okay. So for sheep and goats, you need needles and syringes. Okay. You got to be able to give injections. You need a thermometer and you need a restraint. Okay. So you need to have like a halter that you can, you can put around them and you might consider having a lamb snare, which can be helpful for, um, dystocia, which I'll talk about later. 
you need to have pain medication. So you can have injectable meloxicam or oral meloxicam. You, um, you can have uh, antibiotics. The antibiotics that I recommend specifically are penicillin, fluorophenicol, Draxin, and a TMS, which would be like a Borgol or a Trimidox. I think every farm should have these four things on hand if you're doing sheep and goats. You need to have a dewormer on hand, but you should work with your vet to figure out which one you need. We'll talk about that later in the presentation. You might consider having some vitamins and minerals. For vaccine, you need a CDT vaccine. We're gonna talk about more on that in the next few slides. And then you gotta have stuff ready for, for wound care. So that's just the basic that you gotta have on the farm. Um, the next thing though is stuff you need that if you're gonna have anim uh, breeding animals or babies. So if you're gonna be doing some breeding, I implore you to have this stuff on hand, even if you never ever use it, spending that 20 or 30 bucks to have it there available can make the difference of, you know, you, you saving the life of that animal or not. So a big thing is going to be having mastitis medication on hand. So Spectrum Mass LC is the medication I like to use for mastitis. Um, when a doe or a ewe gets mastitis, you need to treat it immediately. It's not something that can wait till Monday or wait three or four days till the vet can go out and get the medication. You need to have a few tubes of mastitis medication on hand. Um, some people like to have iron and selenium on hand to give to the babies. You need to have lube and gloves to, for birth in, you know, those like long OB sleeves so you can reach up into the vaginal canal and feel the babies. Um, you should also have some vitamins and minerals. And then you really need to have some propylene glycol and some dextrose solution. These are really important for um, goats and uh, ewes that are late in pregnancy um, and they're having trouble getting enough groceries or nutrients and they might get into something called pregnancy toxemia. So you should have this stuff on hand. I mean, the propylene gly glycol, it's like 12 bucks for a four liter jug. The dextrose solution, you know, I think it's like 13 bucks for a bottle of it. So you, you just, just have this stuff on hand and it'll make your life a lot easier if you get into trouble. The other things you might consider having would be oxytocin or amprolium. And amprolium you can usually get from the feed store and it is um, for coccidiosis. And then I just put a note down here about some equipment that you want to have for, for sick babies, but I've got some other slides on specific equipment for sick babies. So, um, so yeah, so make sure you, you look at this list, um, take it back, look at what you currently have in stock on your farm, look at the expiration dates and kind of make a list to say what you need and what you don't need. And then you can say to your vet, hey, I need these five things. Can I get them out on my farm on hand? Okay, so really, really helpful. So um, the next thing is, is um, if you do have a sick animal, you need to make sure that you have some sort of place where you can properly treat them. Um, so you wanna have either a hospital pen or a claiming pen or a kidding pen. And that is gonna be a pen that is safe and dry. It should have some hydro easy access to feed and water. Um, I highly recommend that you put in like one of those Bluetooth cameras in. And, um, you know, if you have a doe that you're waiting on to kit out, you can put her in this pen and watch her on the camera. Um, and you want to have this area be somewhere that you could easily clean and disinfect. Um, and you also want it close to your medical supplies. So it is really important to have a place to actually treat these animals. Um, you know, if you've got a really sick animal, it's, it's not okay just to kind of like let them out in the yard overnight. Um, they're going to have trouble regulating their temperature. They, they need some environmental support with that. Um, this is kind of random, but um, I, I find it's really important to have some goat and sheep clothing on farm. So um, this is a picture of one of my goats. Um, this is Life Jacket. Um, she has a, a traumatic hernia through her rib cage here. And she has a sweater on, but she also has a life jacket because you can see all her little friends have, you know, the demon horns and um, they've been they've been stabbing at her. So um, I would say one of my most used things on sheep and goat calls is some sort of clothing to cover a wound, 
to, to, um, to dry them off, to, to um, give them some extra padding, protect them from bullies, um, or if the animal's cold or needs help recovering. So it's always good to have like, um, you can buy like um, sheep and lamb, like jackets that you can put on them. Um, they are very, very useful and I highly recommend having them. I don't recommend using a life jacket, but you know, sometimes you gotta do what you gotta do. So the, the next thing that goes hand in hand with your first aid kit, of course, is, okay, how do you actually use all these medications that I've just convinced you to buy? So talk to your vet and get a treatment protocol. And so what the treatment protocol is, is it's gonna list what the drug is, how to give it, what cases you would use it for, what the doses, dosage is, um, how long it lasts, and the meat withdrawal. And so the idea is, is that you have stuff on hand, but then you're also empowered with a, a treatment plan to know when you should be using it, how to give it that sort of thing. And the treatment protocol should include medications, pain medications, antibiotics, gastrointestinal support, vitamins and minerals, as well as how to use parasite medications. Um, I see a lot of times I'll go to a farm, a person has like literally $2,500 in medications for their sheep and goats, but they're not sure what the meds are for. They're not sure how to give them. And so having, having that information written down and accessible is really, really important, especially if you're having an emergency, you don't want to be stressing out about this stuff. You want to have this already written down ahead of time. So um, I just put on a, a little quick thing here about injections. Um, we put in a YouTube video here that you can click on the link and it shows you how to give injections to our goat and our sheep friends. Um, as you can see in this picture here, there's a little black triangle. This neck area is where we're gonna wanna be giving shots, okay, for intramuscular shots, um, as well as for under the skin shots as well. So just be mindful that um, the medications do need to go into a certain area. I have had well-intentioned people kind of, you know, give shots in the butt or the abdomen, um, and it had fairly um, poor consequences. So um, you want, you really want to be sticking to the neck region. And there's a lot of really good resources out there on how to, how to do those injections. So when you get the PDF, you can watch that video if you want. It's got kind of a funny twangy soundtrack to it. So um, that kind of goes over some of the, the prep work to have your first aid kit, your hospital pen, your supplies, and knowing and knowing how to treat and what to treat with. So now we're going to kind of walk you through some key small ruminant health topics. Um, and these are, these are in terms of the things that I think are most important and, and things that need immediate intervention from, from the owner. So the first one is going to be bloat. Um, Bloat is going to be most common, I find, in goats, um, and then it can be common in sheep if they get out and overeat. So bloating usually happens from overeating, and it can be grain, it can be forage, um, yeah, they could get into chicken feed, whatever it is, the animal overeats. And what happens is all that, all that contents in that rumen um, it forms this, this froth or this proteinaceous foam. And this foam gets bigger and bigger inside of the rumen. And like the poor little goat just expands and expands and expands. And what happens is that um, that froth is taking up so much space in the abdomen. Um, it actually interrupts the goat's ability to circulate blood and to breathe properly. And it, and it will cause sudden death. Um, so if you're seeing um, bloat signs, you need to treat it pretty fast. So, you know, obviously if you're seeing sudden death as a clinical sign, you know, you're past the interve intervention process, but what you're going to see before that is a distended abdomen and it's going to sound like a basketball. Okay. So I'm not talking about like your old Gert Goatee or Gertie, you know, and she's got the, the big abdomen that goes out to the side or your pregnant girl. I mean, this is a taut, hard, like a football or like a basketball. Okay. The goat's going to be anxious. It's going to be annoyed. It's going to be uncomfortable. It's going to be standing up, sitting down, kicking out the abdomen. Okay. So if you see this, this is an emergency and you should treat it with um, an anti, an anti bloat agent. Okay. And so I put a picture of one. There's a lot of different types of these products. 
There's like anti-bloat, bloat ease, bloat stop, bloat, bloat slow. Like they have all these different names. It's all the same stuff. Um, and uh, what it does is it, um, uh, it causes those bubbles to rupture. Okay. So it's a compound that reverses kind of that protein stability of the bubbles crashes the bubbles and allows the, the goat to properly burp and to burp out all that air and those bubbles out of the rumen to, to allow things to shrink back up. So you should absolutely have some of this bloat ease on your farm. Um, most goats need, you know, 100 to 200 mils of it if they are bloated. So you, you should just have some on farm. It lasts for like three or four years. It's very inexpensive. And you can either give it with a stomach tube um, or you can actually just like squirt it down their mouth with a syringe. So bloat's an emergency. It's easier to treat it earlier on and you want to keep some of this bloat ease stuff um, on hand. Um, if you read online, you can use um, a mineral oil and you can also use uh, uh, sodium bicarbonate or baking soda as well. They don't work nearly, nearly as well as the bloat ease. So only use those if you're like really screwed or really in a pinch. Otherwise you want to use that bloat ease, all right, or anti-gas. So the next one is going to be urinary blockages in goats and sheep. And so this is specifically going to be in our, in our boyfriends here, in our male goats and sheep. And so what happens is that goats and sheep really can't handle a lot of excess mineral. And if they get too much extra mineral in their diet, it goes right into that bladder and that mineral basically just crystallizes and forms stones. That wouldn't be a problem, except that goats and sheep have a very, 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 very tiny, tiny urethra. And so these little, these little pieces of grit, these little pieces of bladder stones and crystals, they get stuck in that urethra. And so they can't pee them out. And then what happens is that because they can't pee, that bladder expands and expands. It just keeps filling up with urine, filling up, filling up, and it starts backing up into the kidneys and it causes major, major damage. So this is, this is life-threatening. Okay. This is, this is, this is not consistent with life. If this is happening, then you need to call the vet. And generally castrated males are at the highest risk of this. Once the goats get castrated, that could impact some of the laxity and size of their urethra. So it just tends to be that we see castrated males affected the most. I put in this picture. Um, so this is of a goat penis. And so you can see that there's this little process hanging off the tip of the penis. That's a urethral process. And so that's what I mean, how, how goat and sheep have these really, really, really short, tiny little penises. And it's really easy for stuff to get stuck in there. So for blocked goats, um, you know, if you think your goat might be blocked, they're going to be restless. They might be dribbling urine, straining to pee, getting up and down, that sort of thing. They usually show you that they're not okay. And if you see this, then you're going to want to call the vet immediately. Um, and, um, and yeah, you don't want to mess around with this, call the vet immediately. And then to try to prevent some of this, you really want to avoid grains and legumes. Um, for your male neutered goats and sheep, if they don't have a job, like if they're not breeding, if they're not, you know, going to be going for lamb chops, if they're just hanging around being companions, they should honestly be getting the driest, crappiest looking hay <laughs> that you could find. Like I, I'm kind of making a joke out of it, but, but these types of goats, like they do not need the beautiful alfalfa horse hay. Like they, they just need like the, the most basic low value, low nutritional content hay. They don't need grain. They don't need legumes. Any of this extra stuff is going to contribute to weight gain as well as to um, formation of these crystals. You also want to avoid these goats being overweight. That's a risk factor. You also want to increase water intake that can help reduce this. Um, and then we're also, you're also going to consider checking the hay and goat mineral levels, which I'm going to talk about in a later slide as well. 
So the next ones are um, some things that commonly are called for a vet to do, but that most producers can do themselves. So this is um, all about hoof trimming. So this is my technician, Grace, and we are trimming a couple of baby doll sheep here. Um, so hoof trimming usually is done once a year, but I find in smaller herds, they need to be done two to four times per year, and you need to assess the animals individually. And so you can actually just kind of lift them up and flip them on their butt. Um, most of the time when I trim feet and I flip, I flip the, the sheep or the goat up, they honestly just fall asleep. It's literally like a, like a man in pedicure for them. A lot of people are nervous about it, but once you kind of get the hang of flipping them over, honestly, it's fine. They enjoy it. It's a good time. If you don't trim your, your small room and it's um, feet, bad things will happen. Okay. So they will get lame. They will have welfare concerns. They're higher, higher likely to get foot rot. And recently I had, um, a goat who went so long that his, his feet had grown out so far that he couldn't walk on them. So he was walking on his knees and he actually got contracted tendons in his legs. So it's pretty serious, uh, for hoof trimming. I mean, it's a lot like trimming our fingernails, right? Like if, if you do it, you know, pretty regularly, um, then it's not a big deal. But, you know, if you let your nails get out to six inches long, it's going to impact your ability to, to function in normal life. And that's the same with our small ruminant friends. And so hoof trimming doesn't have to be daunting at all. Um, there's a lot of good YouTube videos about how to do it. I put um, uh, YouTube pictures there. I put some hoof trimming uh, tools. And so generally with the trimming, we've got two pictures here, kind of a before and after. And usually what we see is we see the outer layer of it kind of start folding over top of the, of the surface of the foot that hits the, hits the ground. And honestly, usually you just have to trim kind of this outer, this outer overgrown area here. And then you get some pretty, pretty nicely, nicely trimmed feet here. So hoof trimming, it's not too bad. There's some decent YouTube videos on how to do it. And these are the specific tools and trimmers that I recommend that we use. So you want to get yourself some sort of a hoof pick, just like you would for um, horses, because you really want to be able to pick the crap and the dirt out of that hoof. And then these are the hoof trimmers that I like. These are the ones that I buy. I do not get any profit from the sales of these, okay? But I can tell you, that they work the best out of the like eight different pairs that I've tried. And then the last thing you're going to want to have is something called cyclospray. And cyclospray is a chlorhexid or sorry, chlortetracycline um, topical spray. And it's an antibiotic spray. And so if you run into foot problems, which we'll talk about in the next slide, you're going to want this spray to help treat these problems. All right. So the main thing you're going to see when you start trimming feet is something called foot rot, and you're going to smell it way before you see it. It smells rotten. It smells bad. <laughs> it smells disgusting. And usually the animals that have foot rot usually are lame. Okay. So if you've got any, any sheep or goat that is lame, you need to flip it over. You need to have a look at its feet because it's probably foot rot. Um, and that foot rot is infectious, meaning that it can spread to the other animals in the group. So foot rot is caused by a couple different bacteria. It's very contagious and especially in wet and moist areas. Um, and this is a picture of an animal that has foot rot. Um, and you can see that the rot has actually penetrated um, into this poor, this poor sheep's foot um, and actually separated the hoof away from it. So this is an example of a foot that um, is going to get a full treatment. And so I've just, I've just included here, this is the, the, res, the recipe that I like to use for foot rot. Um, first things first, wear gloves because it's disgusting and you don't want any of this bacteria on you. Trim the hoof, apply the cyclo spray, which is that, that chlorhexidine spray from the previous slide. Give some meloxicam, which is a pain medication, and then you need to give an injection of fluorophenicol or telethromycin, um, and you need to isolate that animal from the rest of the herd, and you need to check the whole flock. 
because this is infectious. So we need to know if it's just that animal that has it or if there's other animals in the flock that have it. The other thing you wanna remember is if you're working with foot rot and you take those trimmers and you jam that all up in that foot that has foot rot and then you take those contaminated ones and you move it to another animal, you could spread the foot rot yourself because you're using contaminated tools on multiple animals. So if you have foot rot, it's something that you need to just like pause, make a little bit of a treatment plan uh, before you move forward with it because you could inadvertently kind of spread it to, to more animals than you were really anticipating. But this is my protocol and it works really well for me for the odd foot rot case um, for, for sh companion sheep and goats. The next thing I want to talk about is a couple of slides on respiratory disease. So respiratory disease is something that's really common, of course, in our sheep and goat friends. And I find that coughing is extremely common and it can be very hard to know if the goat is just coughing or if they actually have pneumonia. So coughing is very common. Um, they can cough for a lot of different reasons. Dusty hay, change of environment, stress, and coughing doesn't always equal that they have pneumonia. And you really need a, a good assessment or a little physical exam of the animal to understand how sick the animal is to make a treatment plan. So I've just put down here at the bottom of the slide, these are the factors for me um, and most veterinarians that have to come together for it to be a true pneumonia. So if the animal has an elevated rectal temperature, so if they have a fever, if they're coughing, if they have nasal discharge, okay, so they got snot coming out of their nose, and if they're acting off, like they're not alert, they're not bright, they're not responsive, then those things come together to make pneumonia, okay? So, you know, even if they only have three out of the four of these things, that's good enough. But if an animal is just coughing, but they're eating, they're drinking, no fever, no nasal discharge, you know, nothing else wrong with it, that doesn't mean that it has pneumonia. You want to be assessing things like its attitude, nasal discharge, its rectal temperature as well. And then you also want to um, understand risk factors for pneumonia as well. I put in two different kind of situations here. So excuse me, sorry. The first one is that we have three Nigerian dwarf adult goats who were just put inside for the winter. And these are three Nigerian dwarf goats. They lived together for seven years in the same place. They just got put inside for the winter and now they're doing a little bit of coughing and sneezing. In that case, I might check, check that up to like a new environment. You know, now they're closed into maybe a smaller area versus them bopping around the yard. Um, you know, assuming they were acting normally other than the cough and the sneeze, I probably wouldn't worry about it. Um, versus say you have a group of five, three day old dairy bucks that were just purchased from a dairy and mixed with 20 other young dairy bucks from other farms. I mean, this is high risk, right? You're taking a young uh, baby animal that maybe didn't get colostrum you're moving it and now you're mixing it with animals from a different source, you know, that situation is going to be a lot more ripe for pneumonia um, than our three little Nigerian goats that are just kind of going into their winter home, you know. So you also want to think about what your risk factors are for infectious diseases like pneumonia when you're trying to figure out how serious a cough is. So um, I did put in my treatment protocol here so that you could have that. So, you know, just going back to that risk factor idea for bacterial pneumonia, the animals that are going to be at risk are going to be young animals, newly arrived animals, colostrum deprived animals, mixing animals from multiple sources. So if you're bringing new animals on farm um, or, or elderly animals, okay, so there's some risk factors there. For mild cases, you're going to do a meloxicam and a tetracycline. For severe cases, I like meloxicam. You need to move that animal to a hospital pen. It might need extra warmth, extra feeding, and you're going to give it fluorophenicol or telethromycin. Oxytetracycline is not good enough. You need something stronger than that. Um, I do find that um, goats usually do end up with a bit of a chronic cough. 
and may need several rounds of treatment. And then if your animal isn't getting better without, within 24 hours of, of starting that treatment, then you need to call the vet out and you need to do some blood work and potentially some viral testing as well. I just wanted to mention about rectal temperatures. We talked about having a thermometer in the, um, the first aid kit. Using the thermometer properly is a big deal. So in this picture here, we've got someone using the thermometer, but they've barely inser inserted that thermometer into the rectum of the animal versus over here. I know this is a horse, but they have inserted that thermometer all the way to the hub, right up the butt into, into that animal. And that's what you want to do to be able to take a good rectal temperature. If you're just, if you just have that little tip in that thermometer, you're not going to get an active body temperature reading. You got to stuff that thermometer as far up as you can into that butt. And you want to make sure you're not like in a pile of turd in there. You want to kind of go along to, to the wall or the border of the rectum to get the best rectal temperature. And I put in some, some normal temperatures. For goats, they're usually around 39. And for sheep, yeah, they're also usually around 39. Usually anything over 40, 40 and a half, I'm considering a, a temperature. I also wanted to note because um, you're in the Yukon um, and we're talking about respiratory disease is that you guys have control orders in place for mycoplasma over pneumonia. Um, and this is a, a mycoplasma is a type of bacteria that can cause really nasty pneumonia um, in our wild, wild small ruminants, wild sheep. And so um, as you guys know, and, and as the agricultural branch has probably talked to you about, um, there is a significant testing and control uh, program on as well. So it's even more important is if you're concerned about respiratory disease in your animals, or if you're thinking about moving or bringing animals, that you're making sure that you're following what's required um, as part of the mycoplasma oba pneumonia control and monitoring uh, protocols that are have in place there. Um, so yeah, so definitely for respiratory disease, you wanna, you wanna get a vet involved sooner rather than later, and you might have to do some testing as part of this program as well. Okay, so now we're going to talk about um, a few other a few other kind of smorgasbord things. Um, so for vaccines, um, the core vaccine is a CDT vaccine, um, and this this C stands for um, Clostridium perfringens type C, Clostridium perfringens type D, and Clostridium tetani T. So type C, type D, and tetani. That's where the CDT comes from. And this covers multiple types of clostridium, which will absolutely cause death in sheep and goats. So this is a core vaccine. It's pretty inexpensive. Um, and we recommend that it's given uh, in several different ways. So in general, for like your pet goat, um, they need two doses initially, followed by a yearly booster. Goats, I like to booster every six months because their immunity doesn't last as long. For breeding animals, they need two doses to be covered. And then additionally, they need to be boosted two weeks before they're lambing. And for kids and lambs, they need two doses of it at four to eight weeks of age. And then it, again, at eight to 12 weeks of age. So depending upon what you're doing with your production, you might have to boost your animals you know, before they give birth. You might have to be giving vaccine to babies. Um, or if you have a stable population, usually once a year to booster is enough. Uh, but this vaccine is very important. Um, you should absolutely be using it. Um, it works very, very well um, if it is given. So that's an important one. The next one I wanted to touch on again is about nutrition. So um, my understanding is that in the Yukon, there, there is some pasture, but not a ton. And that generally you're getting your hay in from other places. So you might not have a lot of opportunity to maybe get like the exact hay you want, or, you know, if there's hay quality issues, you, you might not have a lot of opportunity to be swapping it with a neighbor or something like that. So in terms of nutrition, I think it's extremely important that you are doing two things. One, you're testing your hay for nutrient contents. All right. And the egg branch can help you with this. You can send in 
a sample of your hay and they will tell you about um, the moisture, the protein, the sugar levels, as well as the mineral contents. And this is going to allow you to figure out if you need to be adding any supplemental grain to your animals to make sure they're getting enough, you know, groceries and as well as enough minerals. In addition, you also need to test your goats and sheep with a pooled blood test to see if you have a sufficient amount of minerals in your sheep and goats. So we talked earlier about too much mineral can be a problem for goats causing bladder stones. Too little mineral can give you issues with weakness, birthing problems, that sort of thing. So understanding how much mineral is in what you're feeding and then how much mineral is actually in the goat or sheep's body is really important. And, and it's done with a blood sample. So um, you'd have your vet come out, they can collect a blood sample on each one of your goats and sheep. And then you can actually pool those and just run one test to get a bit of a screenshot of what your mineral levels are left or are, are actually in the, in the body of the animals. Depending upon how your minerals are looking, that's gonna determine if you need to be supplementing minerals with um, like a fortified grain, salt licks, mineral blocks, loose mineral, what you need to do. I never ever recommend that people just, just start on grain, start on mineral blocks without doing any testing. You need to see where you're at because if you're just adding things that you don't need, it can actually have a, a very harmful effect on your animals. So this is one that it's worth it to spend the you know, 50 or $100 to get your hay as well as your animals tested. And I'm pretty sure there is funding through the Yukon government that they would pay to have this done for you as well. Um, the third component of this is body condition scoring your ewes and your does. You wanna make sure that you're not lambing or kidding out girls that are too large and in charge. If you do this, you're gonna have issues with um, stillbirths, you're gonna have likely issues with ringworm, you're gonna have issues with prolapses. So, you know, especially at shearing time, which is kind of a right now, you wanna make sure that your girls are not too chunky. Um, and kind of going back to this idea that unless you test your feed and you test your animals, you're pretty much guessing at, at you know, what's going on with their nutrition. And in, in the situation in the Yukon where you don't have just tons of options of different types of hay, you know, it's really important that you're making what you have work for you. And last but not least, your pet dwarf male weathered goats, as cute as they are, they do not need grain, okay? They can live, despite what they might tell you, they can live just on hay. And giving them grain is, is pretty much going to almost guarantee that they're going to have some urinary blockages. I'm being a little bit dramatic, but I'm trying to hit home the point that these little dwarf, cute little dwarf male goats, they're adorable. They're usually overweight. They don't need grain. They just need grass. They just need hay. All okay? right. All right. So um, in terms of some other things here. Um, I want to touch on parasite management. Um, again, depending upon your individual setup, that's going to impact how you're going to be looking at your parasites. But I'm going to tell you the core principles of what I use, and then I apply it to different places. So for parasite management, you got to do fecal testing. For the fecal testing, you need individual fresh fecal samples collected from each animal. You need to submit it for a McMaster fecal test. That's the best test. It's the most sensitive. And this test tells you what type of worms and how many of them, which is very, very important. Based on the results of your fecal tests, you're going to deworm sick animals, any ones that have like pale eyelids here, and any worm that has a high worm egg count. And you're going to deworm them based on your goats, sheep, or weight. So that means you'll need a livestock tape or a scale to, to weigh your animals. So individual fecal test, do a McMaster test, only deworm those ones that need it, and then make sure you're getting that weight of that animal so you're properly dosing them. Then you're gonna repeat this yearly or if an animal's sick. If you blanket deworm or deworm the day you put out your friends to pasture, you will create resistance, which will be a big pain in the butt for you in the future. So again, I know that there's um, probably some support from the government to do some of this fecal testing if you would like. I put in an example from some fecals that I ran last week. 
I think we had about 10 different sheep and goats here. And so um, we did them all individually. And so Larry had no eggs. Catherine had 150. Maria had over a thousand. Robert, none. Jeannie, 100. Obi, none. Diane, 300. Dougie Fresh, 250. Link, 50. Georgie, 50. So Maria, she's the only one that really has a high egg, egg count here. And she's the only goat that really needs to be dewormed out of this whole group. So this just goes to show you that in a group that's eating together, exposed to the same things, the amount of worms that an individual goat has or an individual goat or individual sheep has is very variable. It's not just because one has no worms doesn't mean the rest of them have no worms. So that's why it's so important to do individual testing so that you're really only testing who needs it. Okay, I did put a video here on how to collect um, a fresh fecal sample. So you can go ahead and check out that video um, uh, once you get the PDF of the presentation. Um, and it, it's, a, it's a really short, cute little video, it tells you how to collect that sample. Okay, um, there's also um, some really good deworming information. If you click this link here, it tells you what dewormer to use, how much per weight, it tells you withdrawal times, and it tells you things like don't use in pregnant animals or you know, don't use for this types of worms. So there's some really good resources here at Cornell University. And it'll literally, it's just a chart. You look at how much your goat weighs, you figure out which medication you have, and it tells you exactly how much to give and how often to give after you've done your fecal testing, all right? There's also the University of Calgary. They have a really good website about parasites and they really go through the life cycles, what they look like, how to test for them. And so it's a really good place to get good quality background information on the parasite stuff. Um, this is another one that's great for parasites. Um, I would say it's a little bit more intense. Um, the first two that I mentioned are a little bit more accessible. Um, this one is a lot more about like large range pasture management, um, but it can be a good resource as well. Okay, so the last few minutes, I'm just gonna talk a little bit about dystocia and lambing and kidding troubles. So um, again, I'm trying to kind of give you like Paisley's crash course in, in dystocia. I mean, truthfully, that's like four or five presentations in and of itself. So if you are working with a you or a doe that is giving birth, you want to make sure you have OB gloves, lube, lots of lube, a light, some patience, and a lambing snare. You want to assess the doe. Is she actively contracting? Is she standing up? Is she laying down? How long has she been in labor? And I would say the most important thing is actually getting comfortable to reach inside that vagina to say, if that cervix is open, if you can, if you can reach all the way through and get into that uterus, or if the cervix is shut or not, that's probably the most important thing. And then also being able to feel if there's a baby present and being able to identify what position the baby is in. And I'll talk more about that on the next slide. But the biggest thing that you can do to help out with the stow shower lambing or kidding is getting comfortable, getting that glove on and, and getting in there and getting the feel of what does an open cervix feel like? So even on does or sheep that had a fine kidding and, and there was no problem, I still recommend, you know, carefully, gently in a clean way, you know, getting that feel of what is, what is a nice, normal, open vaginal cervix uterus feel like. Um, so, you know, when there's a problem on, on another one that you're helping with, you always want to be gentle. Okay. Like just please be gentle. They're little, they're little. Okay. You can tear them. You can rip them. Just be little, just be gentle. Okay. Um, and then you always want to make sure you're checking for another lamb and a kid. So that goes back to being comfortable enough to go in and to feel and to see if there's another animal there. I've had quite a few times when owners call me, they think that the, that the ewe is done, but she's not acting well. And then I drive out there and I, I pull another lamb out and there was one that was stuck and she couldn't get it. So that's really important. So to support you, I've got this website here. 
They, she's got about 30 different pictures with normal and abnormal presentations. And for each of the presentations, she talks about what, how, how to, how to, how to feel it, how to know which presentation it is, as well as what the techniques are to how to move that foot, how to, how to get that head back and around. And so, like I said, there's a whole bunch of different pictures and videos on it, and you can go to that website and, 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 and look through each one. So she has all these diagrams of normal, and then here's just an example of a head back one. Um, and tells you, you know, what, what to do, how to loop it around and, and how to make it happen for you. It's a really good one. I've used it a lot as well. I've also put in some good, um, uh, webinars for you. These are, these are very recent webinars, um, dystocia management and small ruminants. This is, um, uh, very, very, very detailed and high level uh, information about how to all the tips and tricks around lambing and kidding. So this is just available free on YouTube and you can watch both of these things really good for anatomy, as well as really good for tips and tricks, how to know when to act, how to know when to wait. Okay. So like I said, dystocia could be like a four part thing in and of itself. Um, so I'm just trying to give you like some good resources on where you can go to get help when you need it. Um, so this is a really good one here. Um, as well, if you do get the baby out, which I know you will, because I have faith in all of you, um, you also want to be prepared of, oh, crap, now I've got this lamb or this goat who, you know, maybe isn't doing so well or had a bit of a, a rough start. So you want to have some information and some preparation about reviving, you know, low sugar lambs or cold lambs. And this is a code of practice resource that talks about how to do it all, how to tube them with colostrum, um, how to assess them how to make a lamb warming box, and it goes step-by-step -step instructions. It has, um, I just cut and copied the bottom half of this handout, but on the top half, it gives you a decision tree. You know, if the lamb is cold, what do you do? If it, if it doesn't have a suckle reflex, what do you do? And it really is a really helpful and very comprehensive thing to help guide you through how to take care of those lambs especially when you have like four born or three born and they're all kind of like small and a little silly and they need some extra help. So this also ties back to the first aid kit is having that bottle supply, having milk replacer, having big syringes, having all your supplies ready to go. So you're not fumbling for all this while you're also trying to manage a dystocia and also trying to like resuscitate three lambs or something like that. Um, the other good one here is Vanderplan Consulting, tells you how to bottle feed, financial score, how to use a ram harness, how to do band castration, any sort of these practical skills, how to pull lambs are all available on these videos. And it's 15 bucks, sign up for a month, watch what you want, and then you can cancel it. So it's a really good one too for the dystocia and for the general tips and tricks. So I'm going to stop the presentation there um, on the PDF that you guys are going to be getting. I do have about 10 other resources for you um, on a different small ruminant stuff um, that you can kind of keep in your back pocket, um, different webinar series from different universities. Um, I've got some veterinarians that do uh, virtual workshops on fecal egg testing things that you guys could organize um, for, for yourselves for future events. Um, so I won't, I won't take up question time for that, but just so you know, that's available to you on that, on that PDF that we're going to be sending out. So I will end it there and uh, eagerly await your questions.